Modal logic is, for my money at least, the most exciting form of logic out there. But what does it mean? How do we interpret it? How do we do semantics for it? Let's have a look. Hello everyone, welcome back to The Attic. We are bringing you a series of videos introducing the basic concepts of logic. And in the previous video, we had just started to introduce modal logic. In this video, we're going to take a more detailed look at how semantics for modal logic goes. If you are enjoying these videos, if you're finding them useful, why don't you send me a cake? And if you don't want to do that, you could just subscribe to the channel. We're going to be doing relational structures, okay? That is going to be the basics of our semantics for modal logic. So a quick recap. A relational structure is something that looks like this. There are some blobs, which we think of as possible worlds, but we could just call them states or points or whatever. Doesn't really matter. And we've got relations between them. We've got an accessibility relation. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't really matter what it means, but you can think of it as relative possibility. That's one way of thinking about it. So this world is possible relative to that one. That one is possible relative to that one and relative to itself. These are possible relative to each other. If that makes good sense to you, great. That's how you think about these arrows. If that doesn't make much sense to you, then don't think about it like that. It doesn't really matter what it means because basically we're going to learn to do semantics for modal logic by following the arrows. You're either going to follow some arrows or all of the arrows. What the arrows mean doesn't really come into it that much. OK, so what do we do with these relational structures? Well, we can give our points, our possible worlds, a name, and then we label them. We label them with our primitive sentence letters, P, Q, R, or whatever. So where a P is true, we write it. Here we've got P being true, here we've got P being true, and Q being true. And where a sentence isn't true, we just leave it blank. So here, neither P nor Q is true. Here, P is true, but Q isn't true. Then all the other sentences we're going to work out by calculating up from there. OK, so the ands, the ors, the nots, the if thens, we do basically just like a truth table. So here we've got P, Q being true. So we could say that P and Q are true. Here we've got P being true, but not Q. So we can say P and not Q is true. So we do that within a world. Just looking at this world, I can work out the value of P and Q. But when we get to the box and the diamond, these are the modalities that we think of as meaning it's necessarily the case, that's the box, or the diamond, meaning it's possibly the case, it's possible that. That's when we have to start jumping around these worlds, OK? That's when we have to start moving around. The diamond is going to mean some world I can get to is a certain way. The box is going to mean all the worlds I can get to are a certain way. OK, let's now go over that in a bit more detail. So first up, let's look at exactly what we mean by a model. It's a triple. There are three things that make up a model. There is W, a set of points. OK, we think of those as being the possible worlds, but they could be literally anything for all we care. There's the accessibility relation. Those are the arrows between those points, between those worlds. And there's a valuation function, dishing out truth values, true or false, to the primitive sentences. But unlike the valuation in propositional logic, we don't just say this sentence is true, this sentence is false. We have to say where it's true and where it's false. OK, so we might say that sentence P is true at world one, but it's false at world two. So that's what our valuation function is going to do. So we can write that down like this. The valuation function V taking in two arguments, a primitive sentence letter and a possible world. And it might say that sentence P at possible world S is true. And it might also say that sentence Q at the same possible world is false. So we would draw that possible world out like this. It's got the name S and P is true there. So we write P, but Q isn't true there. So we don't write Q there. 
The accessibility relation, that's the thing that we draw out as arrows between points between possible worlds, we can also capture that in a set theoretic way as a set of ordered pairs, okay? They're just different representations of the same thing. So this pair, S1, S1, just means there's a little loop on S1. S1 is accessible to itself. This one, S1, S2, means there's an arrow from S1 to S2. S2 is accessible from S1, or S2 is possible relative to S1. Just different ways of presenting the same information. So we can define a model like this if you want to, but we're always going to draw it out like this so we can see what's going on and that we can visually move around a model and calculate whether a sentence is true or false at this or that point in the model. Now we want to define truth in a model. So again, we're not just saying that this sentence is true or false. We have to say where it's true or false. So when we're defining this symbol, whatever makes sentence A true, we're doing it relative both to a model and to a state in that model, a possible world in that model. So it might be that at this point, the sentence is true, but at that point, at that possible world, the sentence is false within one model. Here's the definition we give for truth in a model. Now, when we write this out officially, yeah, we're going to have to say which model we're talking about. But often what happens in practice is we fix a model, we say that's our model, and we're going to kind of move around within that model so we're going to want to know what state we're talking about, what possible world we're talking about, but the model stays fixed. So we can just not bother writing it in because we know which model we're talking about. So our definition is often going to be written down with just S on the left hand side. So we're talking about relative to a state S, a possible world S in the model. When is a primitive sentence letter true? Well, when our valuation function tells us that it's true at that possible world. When is a sentence, a negated sentence true? When the unnegated sentence is false, not made true at that state. When is A and B true? When both A is true on its own and B is true on its own. OK, that's just like a truth table. There's similar truth table clauses for or, for if then and for if and only if. I'm not going to go through them here. If you don't know what they are, take a look back at the video for propositional logic truth tables. The interesting clauses, the new ones are the ones for the box and for the diamond. OK, box basically means all worlds you can get to. So let's look at the official clause and then let's say what it means. Box A is true at state S if for all states U, if S is related to U, so if there's an arrow from S to U, then U makes A true. OK, A is true at state U. What does that mean in practice? Well, this for all U, R, S, U, only if, only if is an arrow going that way, remember. So this bit means all accessible worlds, all accessible states. So a shorthand way of saying this, an easier to understand way of saying this would be all accessible states, A is true there. So box A is true at state S, if and only if A is true at all the accessible states, all the states that I can get to from S. Diamond A, by contrast, it's basically just the same, but with some in place of all. So diamond A is true at state S, if and only if there's a state that I can get to, and A is true there. So diamond A means some accessible state, box A means all accessible states. So we've got our relational structures labelled up, that's our models, and we've got a definition of truth in the model. The other notions we need are validity and entailment. So if we've got some premises and a conclusion, when do those premises entail the conclusion? So entailment usually means if the premises are true, the conclusion's true. It can't be the case that the conclusion is false when the premises are true. And that applies to all models. Now we've got this extra parameter of possible worlds within the model, we're basically just going to say it holds for all of them. So the premises entail the conclusion when, for all models, all states in the model, if they make the premises true, they also make the conclusion true. So any state in any model, if it makes the premises true, it had better make the conclusion true too. Putting it the other way round in terms of counterexamples, OK, an entailment holds when there's no counterexample. What would a counterexample be? Some state in some model where all of the premises are true, but the conclusion 
isn't true. That's a counterexample, a counter model to an entailment. The entailment holds if there's no such counterexample. Counterexamples are going to be important later on when we're constructing models. We're often going to try to invalidate an entailment by drawing out a counter model. We're going to get onto that later. So if that's entailment, what is validity? Well, validity is basically entailment from zero premises. So validity is going to mean for all models, for all states in that model, the sentence is true. So again, a counterexample to validity is basically just some state in some model where the sentence isn't true. And if you think about it, that falls out of the previous definition of entailment for the case when the premises are the empty set. So you can think of validity as a special case of entailment when there are no premises there at all. OK, let's finish up this discussion on semantics for modal logic by looking at two important principles concerning validity in modal logic, in all of the modal logics that we're going to be looking at. The first one goes like this. Suppose we've got some valid sentence, A. OK, so if that sentence is valid, then box A is also going to be valid. That's called the necessitation principle. Let's just see why that is the case. Let's see why that's true. So suppose that A is indeed valid. What does that mean? Well, in all models, at every state in every model, A is true. So I take a model, I look everywhere in that model, A is going to be true everywhere. Now pick any state in that model. Anywhere it can get to is going to be a state where A is true, because A is true everywhere. So at the state we picked, box A is going to be true. That's going to hold for any state in any model. OK, so box A is going to be true at every state in every model. And that's just what validity means. So box A is going to be valid. Putting it all together, if A is valid, then box A is valid. Now, this is an important principle to get right because it's kind of easy to get this wrong, to misunderstand it. It's not saying that we can infer box A from A in the same way that we can infer, for instance, A from A and B. So you might have some reasoning that's got A and B as a premise from which you can legitimately infer A as a conclusion. That's not what's going on here. If you're doing some reasoning and you've got A as a premise, you can't infer box A as a conclusion. Think about the interpretation that we're going to use where box A means necessarily. It's necessarily the case. I can't infer from Mark is sitting here talking to it's necessarily the case that Mark is sitting here talking. OK, I might not be. So we can't infer from A to box A. What this is telling us is about valid sentences. If A is a valid sentence, one that we can prove in modal logic, then box A is also valid, one that's always true everywhere, one that we can prove in modal logic. Second important principle that comes up as a validity in modal logic is called the distribution principle, the distribution axiom. And it's a basically a way of saying if we've got a necessary if then, a necessary conditional, then we can transform it into a conditional involving necessary things. So reading it all out, it says, if it's necessary that if A then B, then if it's necessary that A, then it's necessary that B. So quite a mouthful. That is a valid principle in modal logic, in all the modal logics that we're going to be looking at here. And basically what it's saying is when we've got an antecedent like this, we can take the box here and distribute it in front of the A and the B. So it's an interaction principle between the box and the arrow. Again, let's have a think about why that's true in all modal logics. So to do that, we're going to assume this bit and try and get our way to this bit. So suppose it's necessary that if A, then B. That means any world in the model that I can get to where there's an A, there'll also be a B. OK, so that's the bit we're assuming. Any world I can get to where there's an A, there'll be a B. Now suppose also that it's necessary that A. That means every world I can get to, there's an A. Put those two things together. It's going to be the case that every world I can get to, there's going to be a B. That's what box B means. So we've proved that if this and this, then this. That basically means the same thing as if this, then if this, then this. So this thing is valid in modal logic. So there you have semantics for modal logic. 
in the next video, we're going to continue on this theme and show how by tweaking little bits of this model, tweaking how the arrows within a relational structure works, we can give a whole range of different systems of modal logic. So if that sounds good to you, hit that subscribe button, hit the bell icon to get your updates. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you so much for listening. If you've got some questions, leave me a comment down below. I will see you guys back next time.